Hello, and welcome to Successful Communication in a Virtual Classroom. I'm Eric Kerman, and I'll be your workshop facilitator today. Teacher Creative Materials is a family-owned company that began in the garage of a teacher over 40 years ago. Our founder, Rochelle Cracciolo, envisioned creating a company focused on one vision, to create a world in which children love to learn. All of our materials and resources are created by teachers, for teachers and students, with this vision in mind. Our goals today are to define communication as it relates to social-emotional learning, promote positive interactions between the teacher and the students and among students, and build effective communication in the virtual classroom to facilitate social-emotional learning. What you'll need today is first off, your mind and your heart. You also have a learning reflection guide. You'll need a pen or pencil to fill in some ideas and answers along the way. If you'd like, sticky notes can be helpful as well. Let's start off by defining communication. Communication is the transmission of information, including feelings, thoughts, perceptions, expectations, commands, attitudes, knowledge, and more. There are a few basic requirements of communication. We start off with an idea or a message. Then we need a sender and a receiver and a medium or mode. We might have communication from the teacher to the students, from the student to the teacher, or among the students. And of course, communication can be verbal or nonverbal and can include the four language modalities of reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So think about communication in your classroom, and think about communication in the virtual classroom. What have been your successes and challenges in terms of student communication thus far? In your learning reflection guide, you'll see this question as well as the stop and do icon. That means that every now and again, we're going to stop the webinar, you'll press pause, and reflect upon your learning thus far. Take a moment now, pause the webinar, and complete the stop and do in your learning reflection guide. Welcome back. You might have added any number of communication challenges that you have faced in the virtual classroom or in a face-to-face -face classroom. Communicating in a virtual environment can be challenging for students. Some of them feel especially shy or not wanting to respond when they're on camera. Other students have challenges communicating their feelings. They might have a challenge recognizing and responding to other people's feelings. Or they may have difficulty incorporating in the key vocabulary that you are sharing with your students and that they're learning. Some people have reported just having students respond at all in a virtual environment has been challenging. We'll look at some strategies to help increase communication in the virtual environment today. Now, in terms of communication and social-emotional learning, let's start by reviewing what social-emotional emotional learning, or SEL, is based on the Collaborative for Academic Social-Emotional Learning's five core competencies. CASEL has developed these competencies over the last 20-plus years. They are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. In terms of communication, these particular competencies manifest in a variety of ways. For example, in self-awareness, students might communicate their feelings as well as their specific needs. In self-management, students might communicate how and when they self-regulate needs that they have in terms of taking a break, that they're escalating, that something is going on. In social awareness, students communicate effectively based on social cues in a variety of contexts and with a variety of people. In terms of relationship skills, students communicate to build and foster positive relationships. And in responsible decision-making, students communicate the decision-making process. Now, these are just simple examples of these five core competencies in SEL and how communication relates to them. Of course, it's, there's more to it than just these few examples here. Let's start looking at two specific communication facets. First off is teacher communication. 
Here, consider what you communicate to the students. Many times this will be about the content that you're teaching them at any given time. And then also consider how you communicate to students, how you're transmitting those messages to them. And think about the opportunities you provide for students to communicate with you as the teacher and with each other. In terms of student communication, students should have the opportunity to explicitly practice the skills that have been taught in the classroom. And we need to teach skills explicitly in terms of communication and how students communicate. Now, for you as a teacher, model what you want to see in your students. Start off with using precise vocabulary. Use precision when speaking and writing. Be clear and comprehensible and use student-friendly language, but also model the academic language that you want students to learn and to incorporate into their speech and into their writing that you want them to understand when they're reading something or listening to something or someone. In terms of how, have a friendly affect. Be honest and authentic, though. Show your emotions in a way that you want your students to show theirs. For example, when you're frustrated, communicate that. When you're happy or pleased, share that with them. There was an old adage in education when I started as a high school teacher many years ago. It was never smile until after winter break. But learning is a social endeavor and is relationship-based. We need to model for our students that having feelings is a part of being human and that we can share those feelings in ways that are authentic and meaningful. In terms of teaching communication then, provide multiple opportunities for students to communicate. You might provide opportunities for students to share with a partner, for example. Now in face-to-face -face learning, this is a common practice among teachers, where you would say that you'd ask a question or ask students to share something with a person sitting near them. Or you might have had them work in triads or small groups. In the virtual environment, this becomes a little bit more challenging because students aren't seated right next to each other. So we should still provide opportunities, though, for students to check in, brainstorm, process with other students. So how might we do that in the virtual environment? Well, there are a number of ways to incorporate this in. One can be through a quick chat message where students use the learning platform that you're using to chat with each other via the chat feature. Or you might utilize a breakout room where students can go into a virtual space together and have a conversation. You might have students call each other over the telephone if they have each other's phone numbers or send an email. Depending on your particular situation, we want to have differing opportunities for students to be able to talk with one another, to brainstorm, to collaborate, and to communicate. One suggested resource is flippity.net. On flippity.net, you'll find a random name gem generator. In that tool, you enter in the students' names, and it will help you to randomly call on students if you want to, to have them share something. Another feature there, though, related to have them work with a partner in triads or small groups, is a random group generator within that same tool. You can divide students into random groups of two, three, four, or five. And then, again, put those students into a breakout room, for example, or have them chat via the chat feature, start an email string with each other, etc. It's a free resource. There's no sign-in required, and it's very easy to use. We'll still need to scaffold communication. One of the challenges that I've been hearing in the virtual environment is just getting students to talk and to communicate at all. So one of the things you can do is provide the key vocabulary that students will be learning. Of course, this is likely a normal part of your instruction is teaching vocabulary. And ask students, one, to identify it in terms of receptive language. That means when they're listening or when they're reading to look for the key vocabulary words that you've been teaching and also to incorporate that key vocabulary in productive language in speaking and writing, and then hold them accountable to do so. For example, you might have students read something and circle the key vocabulary words that they have found that you've been teaching. You might have students count the number of times that the vocabulary was utilized 
when you are giving a uh, speech or, or a short lecture, so to speak, or providing instruction to them. You might ask them to build it into their speech. One way to do that is if the students, uh, say, are talking about plants and they say, the, well, the things that hold them into the ground. And you say, yes, we have a specific word for that. What is that word, everyone? Roots. That's correct. Everyone? Roots. Uh, what's the specific word for the things that hold them into the ground, as you just said? And ask the student to say roots. Now, this is a very simple example, but you get the idea of holding them accountable to incorporating that vocabulary into their speech or into their writing. You can also ask students to incorporate a certain number of vocabulary words into their writing, for example. Please use five of the ten or seven to ten vocabulary words that we've been focusing on this week. Use at least three of them in your writing and underline them so that I can find them quickly and that you can see those words are in your writing. You can also incorporate sentence starters or sentence frames, paragraph frames, and signal words into your instruction. Sentence starters are, just as they sound like, a way for students to start the sentence. So going back to our simple example of teaching about plants, you might have the students turn to a partner or via chat say something like, uh, it give them the prompt, one plant part that we've been learning is, and they have to fill in the blank. So rather than just typing in leaves, flowers, stems, roots, they need to utilize the sentence starter. One plant part we've been learning about is stems. One plant part we've been learning about is roots, etc. The same can be done with a paragraph frame where they have most of the paragraph there and then they fill in keywords along the way. Or signal words might be compare and contrast words or cause and effect words that students can build into their writing or into their speech. Now in terms of building in communication, allow for frequent responses to build students' confidence along the way. So for example, start with just one word responses. Then you can build in short phrases or complete sentences later on. You'll definitely want to increase communication opportunities as needed in your classroom, whether that's face-to-face -face or virtual. So use the 10-2 rule. The 10-2 rule states that for every about 10 minutes of instruction, there should be about two minutes of processing time. Now that processing might be in any number of ways. You might have them do a quick write. You might have them say something verbally to you, to a partner, to a small group, etc. But there should be a pause. Now the 10-2 rules is not hard and fast in terms of the numbers. It's a chunk of information. That might be just a few minutes, maybe five minutes if you're working with students in kindergarten or first grade. If you're working at the middle school level, that might be more like 10, 12, 15 minutes at a time. But everyone needs a pause to process information after a chunk has been delivered to them. Provide then, once you have decided when to make that break and say, okay, we're going to process information, provide a specific prompt for students that they can answer. If it's too general, they won't know what to say. So consider building in a number. Name two or three plant parts that we have been studying. You might use response frames, as we just discussed a moment ago. And you can use structured dialogue. Structured dialogue is when you tell the students who is going to go first in their conversation. So you might say something like, the person born earlier in the year is going to go first. So if I were partnered with you, I have a December birthday. So depending on when your birthday is, then you might go first or you might go after me. My birthday is December 3rd. So if yours is after December 3rd, I would go first. If your birthday is before December 3rd, then you would go first. And step three is hold students accountable. Ask them to share. Often I'll ask students, what did your partner say? Or what was an idea that your group talked about? That way it's not just on them to have the correct answer, but it holds them accountable to listening to what the responses were of their partners or their groups and sharing that with the class. Consider now how you teach communication in your classroom and what opportunities do you provide for your students to practice communication skills? What scaffolding do you provide? Do you need to add anything or did you get some new ideas today?
Pause this webinar, go to your learning reflection guide, and complete the stop and do. Welcome back. Of course, there are a number of ways that students can communicate in the classroom, and especially in a virtual environment. As we all know, they can respond verbally. They can also respond in writing. They can respond using an action. And we can build in some active reading strategies as students are using this receptive language skill. First off, they can respond verbally. So as we've mentioned, they can work with a partner, with a team, or a huddle group. And again, that might be in a breakout room, that might be via email or via phone call. You can also ask individuals to respond. Now, I recommend calling non-volunteers in this particular instance quite often. You can certainly ask for volunteers every now and again. The issue is that the volunteers tend to be the students who are fast processors, who are extroverted, and students who are more introverted or need a little more pro processing time uh, generally don't always raise their hand right away and may not get called on. So try calling on non-volunteers. You might use the random name generator in Flippity. There's also another tool called Wheel of Names. It's the same thing. You can do a quick search for it online where you type in the students' names, you click on the wheel, and it stops on a random person, and you can have them share. Of course, classroom discussions are always fun and effective as well, and you might build in some of the scaffolding we have talked about, such as sentence frames or uh, sentence starters. And you can build in ones like, I agree with what such person said, because, or I'd like to add that, and have students build in those responses in their discussions. When teaching communication and teaching speaking specifically, be explicit in terms of the skills you want your students to practice. So for example, you might ask them to be loud and proud. Teach them projection. What does that mean to project your voice without yelling? And you might ask them to, as they're saying a vocabulary word, for example, say the word softly, say it quietly, say it loudly, shout it out. Say it so someone in the next group or row can hear you. Say it so someone in the next room can hear you, etc. Give them a variety of practice opportunities to modulate their voice. Now, eye contact is an interesting one in that it is a cultural behavior. And eye contact varies among cultures. So depending on the particular students that you're working with, they may have eye contact norms that are different from your own. You can teach students that here in the U.S. and in, the, in classrooms in the United States, eye contact is expected and that it's not necessarily staring at someone, but that you should provide regular eye contact every few seconds or so. This includes when someone in authority is talking to them, if they're getting reprimanded, for example, or uh, somebody in, in power or authority, the principal or a police officer or a politician or uh, someone who has authority, when they're talking to them, they should make eye contact. When they're giving a speech and they're talking to the class or they're addressing the class and they're addressing their classmates, they should make eye contact with their classmates, not just with the teacher. Sometimes this needs to be explicitly taught. Facial expressions can also be taught to students to monitor what does their face look like and what kind of impression does that send to others? Posture, to sit up straight or stand up straight when they're speaking. To use their hands and use gestures effectively when they're speaking as it provides an impact to the listener and to the receiver of the message. In terms of action, we can have students point to or touch something. So we might say, for example, Point to the paragraph where it talks about this particular scientific concept. Point to the number in this math problem that is the first number we're going to be working with. Point to where the character, you get the idea. You can also have students use gestures themselves to communicate. So for example, you might have them give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. 
You might have them uh, have a virtual hand raised. You might have them give an applause. I've seen in many classrooms where teachers used the quiet coyote to ask students to quiet down. I've seen people use a zero noise signal where they make a zero with their hands to indicate that it's time to finish their conversations. There are lots of gestures out there. You can certainly do a search and find some that will work for your classroom. Facial expressions can also be used. So one way to do this is, that I've had some success with with students is to tell them, in just a moment, you're going to show me with your face your understanding of the directions I just gave. First, if you understood the directions, you have no questions, give me a big smile. If you understood the directions, but you need a little bit of clarification, you still have a question. Neutral face. And if you're confused and you have several questions, show me a scrunchy face. When I give you the signal, show me with your face your level of understanding. One, two, three, show. And then the students either smile, neutral face, or scrunchy face to show their level of understanding. We talked a little bit about hand signals and quiet coyote, for example. And then response cards are another one. With the response cards, you can have students use, for example, a red, yellow, and green card. That might be a piece of construction paper that's been cut up, or they might even color on an index card. Then they would show the red card for, I disagree, for example, or no. Or it might be, I need several more minutes to complete this task. The yellow card might be neutral. I don't agree, I don't disagree. Or it might be, I need just a minute or two to finish up this activity. Green card, I agree, or I'm ready to go. And you can change those definitions as desired, but students either hold up the card uh, virtually, or they can um, put it on their desk if you're face-to-face -to, -face to show my level of agreement, uh, my level of understanding, how much time we need, etc. You can also teach students listening skills. In terms of listening, here are some do's and don'ts for the person who is doing the listening. First, teach students to focus on the speaker and not just focus on themselves. The idea here is that many times when we're listening to someone, we're already starting to formulate our response before we even hear the entire message. Also teach students to restate, reflect, repeat key words in their, or excuse me, key points in their own words, rather than ignoring facts or feelings or just repeating, mm hmm or ah, uh -huh, or parroting the words back to the, the speaker. Ask clarifying questions along the way if you're not sure about something. Don't feign understanding. And show listening with your eyes, with your body, with your voice, and with your heart. You don't, they don't need to fill in all the spaces with their own words. Again, this is a cultural piece where how much time people pause between words or sentences or ideas may vary. Let's look at some written communication ideas. First are quick writes. A quick write is just what it sounds like, a limited amount of time to write down your ideas. Again, you might provide a scaffold of a sentence starter or sentence frame if you'd like to. But have students jot down as many ideas as they can or as many facts as they can within a short amount of time. Usually I'll give students a minute, a minute and a half. Sometimes I vary it and I'll say, okay, you've got 40 seconds. If I'm uh, feeling a little bit playful, I might say, you've got 51 seconds or give them an odd time. You can also have them use whiteboards. Physical whiteboards are great where students can write or sketch on the whiteboard and hold it up to the camera, or if they're face to face, of course, they can hold it up in the classroom. There are a lot of virtual whiteboard applications as well where students can sketch, they can write, they can add an image or a visual. One virtual whiteboard that I would recommend is whiteboard.fi, F is in Frank. It's free to use, very simple to use. There's no sign in or anything like that. And it provides the opportunity for the teacher to monitor what the students are writing on their whiteboards, as well as display a whiteboard to the students. For physical whiteboards, if you don't have whiteboards to send home uh, and students are working virtually, 
you can use sheet protectors. I'll usually put a piece of cardstock in there just so it makes it a little bit more stiff. The benefit of, of sheet protectors as whiteboards as well is that you can put in a graphic organizer or put in a piece of text for students to annotate. So they're a fun and easy and very economical tool. For reading, there's a number of ways we can keep students actively engaged. One is through silent reading. Have them read something silently. And you might just start with a sentence or a, a short phrase. Students can engage in whisper reading. In whisper reading, all the students are reading aloud but in a very quiet voice. Now, virtually, if they're in a virtual classroom, what I do when I'm having students whisper read is I will either ask them to unmute or, if I can, I unmute them myself so that I can listen to them read for a moment or two. Now, I tell them that I'm going to do this. So my directions would be something like this. Okay, students, we're going to read this next paragraph, and I'd like you to read it in a whisper. So those of you on camera, I expect to see your mouth moving because you are reading aloud. I'm going to unmute or ask you to unmute one at a time so I can hear your whisper reading along the way. We're going to read for three minutes. Ready? Begin. Now, you can vary that example of how many minutes or how much they're going to be reading, but hopefully you get the idea. Choral reading is when everyone is reading at the same time, like a chorus is when they're singing. Same thing here. I don't generally recommend that you ask students to choral read in a virtual environment with everyone unmuted at the same time. Due to lags in the platforms and the sound, it just becomes very chaotic sounding. So I'll ask one or two students to unmute and chorally read with me. But my expectation is that everyone who is at home is also reading aloud, and if they're on camera, I want to be able to see that their lips are moving. Close reading is when we read aloud as a teacher, and we leave out specific or strategic words, and the students chorally say the next word. So for example, if we were to close read the title of this slide, I might say something like this, ways to, and you would respond, communicate. You can also have individuals read aloud, of course, or choose individuals to engage in any of these previous activities along the way. Let's think about your classroom again. What verbal, action, writing, and reading opportunities are already strongly in place in your classroom, and what strategies might you add, especially as they relate to teaching in the virtual environment? Take a moment, pause this webinar, and complete the stop and do in your learning reflection guide. Welcome back. Let's look at social emotional learning and communication in specific and the competencies of self-awareness, social awareness, and relationship skills. There are lots of projects, games, and activities that you can provide for your students that give them opportunities to practice self-awareness and social awareness. They also provide opportunities to build relationships. Now, we all know that relationships are absolutely key in learning. If you don't have a good relationship with your students, it creates a barrier for learning. I would also add that if students don't have positive relationships with their peers, that also builds a barrier and doesn't allow for as effective learning opportunities to occur. So how can we build relationships with students? Let's take a look at some strategies. For self-awareness, you might start with just asking students, how are you feeling today? You now, you don't have to have everyone answer every single time, but the idea is to have students share about their emotions. This builds self-awareness along the way of, well, how am I feeling? I have to think about that for a second. And it also builds empathy for others as they hear how other people are feeling and why, the things they're going through in their lives, whether they're very happy, they're not so happy, they're upset for some reason, whatever their feelings happen to be. And it builds relationship skills as students learn about each other. Another strategy you can utilize is the emoji check-in. Here, you use one or more emojis or other symbols, like a heart of a specific color, to share how you're feeling. 
So you should define the emojis with specific vocabulary or a range of vocabulary words to have students accurately name their emotions. You can use color as a scale from, for example, red is I'm feeling great, orange is I'm feeling really good, yellow I'm feeling good, etc. You can ascribe whichever feelings to whichever colors makes most sense to you, of course. Same with the emojis. You can add words and phrases that depict a variety of emotions for a particular emoji. You can also have students do a weather report. This can be a fun one where students use the weather as a metaphor for how they're feeling. They can write about it or discuss it with a partner. For example, they might say that they're, it's, there's fog because they're feeling tired. Or it's sunny and they're feeling happy. Or there's rain today. I'm sad. I've been crying. Now, they can do this in a couple of different ways. One way is purely metaphorical. The morning is starting off with a thick fog. Later in the morning, the fog will start to break up, and we anticipate sunny skies for the rest of the afternoon. Or they might use that same example and say something like, It's a little foggy this morning because I didn't get a good night's sleep last night. I woke up when the dog jumped on my bed and started licking my face. But I think that sunny skies are ahead because I'm starting to wake up now and I'm having some fun with my teacher and with my friends. So they can build in the reasons of and how it relates to their feelings and emotions, or they can just keep it as a pure metaphor, whichever your choice is. You can also have students use images to show how the, they're feeling based on the, on the weather. You can either share pictures with them or have them choose pictures to share their emotions either orally or in writing and display those. You can also have students use art to express emotion. Here, they use different colors to represent different emotions. We used the heart emojis earlier as an example, but in this one they can use a variety of colors within the heart or within another shape to express the differing emotions that they might be feeling and how strongly they're feeling those particular emotions. This builds in complexity, that we're not always necessarily just feeling one emotion at a time, that multiple emotions can be felt at the same time. You might have students color in a, an image, such as a, something geometrical, or it might be a heart shape, or it might be a person, an outline of a person, where you instruct them to uh, color in the places in their body where they're most feeling those emotions. There's a variety of ways to do this. The idea really is to get students to be self-aware of how are they feeling at the moment and, per, and what are the variety of emotions that they're feeling. You can also teach students specific vocabulary associated with a variety of feelings and emotions. Let's face it, feelings and emotions are complex. They're not simple. So there's multiple, many, many, many vocabulary words that go along with our emotions. You can teach students to think about the nuance and the variance in emotions and use the precise vocabulary to help express that. In your learning reflection guide, I provided a sample list of feeling words by grade level band. Take a look at the grade level band words that fit your particular context and review those words. Box the words your students know and use on a regular basis. Underline the words that they would likely recognize but maybe they don't use so often. And circle the words that they're likely unfamiliar with. Then consider how your students will benefit from learning additional feelings and emotions vocabulary. Pause now and complete this stop and do in your learning reflection guide. Welcome back. Another activity or project you can have students do is to have them share about themselves. And I've named this in three different ways and you can choose one of these names or even make up a different name if you'd like. So for primary, I might call it a few of my favorite things. For the intermediate levels, I might call it collector's items. And for the middle school level, I might call it priceless artifacts. 
The idea is that students gather some items from around their house. You might make it three to five. You can change that number if you'd like. For the primary students, I might just ask them to share things that they like. It might be something that's important to them. As students get a little bit older in the intermediate grades, I might ask them to include pictures or memories. Or, and as students get older, I might ask them to choose things that best represent them. Those might be articles of cultural significance. Those might be pieces that relate to their identity. Then the students present their favorite things, their collector's items, their priceless artifacts to the class. You can have one student do it per day, for example, or a couple a week, however you would like to. And as one person presents, the other students ask questions or make comments. They're getting to know their classmates better as the person is presenting a little bit about themselves. And the person presenting is practicing speaking and listening, but so are the other students. You can provide students with some question stems here if you would like. Tell me more about, or I'm unclear about this particular item, or can you show that again and tell me more about where you got it? Any number of questions, of course, can be asked. You could provide some students or brainstorm with them what are some questions we might ask of each other when we're presenting this, so that when the person's presenting, there are some questions that they can ask along the way. Another related strategy is to have students do identity maps or an all about me project. Some of you may have done something like this before, where it's a self-introduction and it's driven by the student. The student can dictate how personal this is. You might have a few requirements, such as you have to have your name and you have to have a picture of yourself. And from there, they might add things like what their favorite book or sport or team or movie is. They might say they're a fan of something. They might express their likes and dislikes, their family, their friends, their cultural values. There's a number of platforms you can use. You might try using Jamboard. I'll show you an example of Jamboard in just a minute. It's an online whiteboard application. Or you might have students use Google Slides or PowerPoint to build a slide that they're going to use to share with the class. All three of these can be used, of course, in the virtual environment. They could also be used face-to-face. -face. For Google Slides, you might have them all working on one collaborative document where they can see each other's slides. Or you might have them build one slide at a time and send it to you. Same with the PowerPoint idea. You can put those together and then have a class presentation. You could show that presentation on a slideshow, or you could print it off and make a virtual, or excuse me, a, a physical book that the students could then have to remember about themselves and their classmates uh, during that particular school year. Here's an example of what it might look like in Jamboard. Students can add sticky notes, they can draw on their whiteboard, they can add pictures. And you'll see in the red circle up at the top there that there's a number of whiteboards that you can build for your class so that each student would have one. To build social awareness, we might do the activity called Name That Emotion. Here we use pictures as a tool to have students identify and discuss emotions. Students can match feelings and emotion words to the pictures. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. Virtually, you might build a PowerPoint slide with some pictures on it, as well as some words. Then the students would have to drag those words to the pictures to match the feelings or emotions with the picture. If you're able to send home materials or in the physical classroom, you might give students a piece of paper with the pictures, and with some words, they have to cut them up and same thing, match those up, doing a more hands-on activity. Here's some examples of pictures that I found. I like to choose pictures that some that are quite concrete and seem relatively obvious and some that are a little more complex. And in that way, it begins to help students understand that emotions are complex and how people display those emotions can also be complex and can vary depending on the particular culture that the person comes from. We can also have students identify the feelings and emotions of characters in literature, for example, or people in history as we're reading a piece of text. Whether that's through pictures, the actions that we're reading about, and things that are happening 
the context, uh, have students consider and identify feelings of emotions of others to help build social awareness. Another fun activity can be words from another world. In this activity, one student, the one from another world, speaks in gibberish, and another student quote-unquote translates for them. The other students can ask clarifying questions along the way. The idea is that the student who is from another world, who's speaking in gibberish, is using tone of voice, gestures, body language, facial expressions, and the person translating is using those to state what the person is saying. It's a fun and silly game that students can utilize to share how and share how people express themselves using nonverbal cues and also to build social awareness. Make sure that you link social awareness and communication for students. Link that emotions and communication are linked together. And have them consider how our words, our actions, our body language affects other people affects how they hear the particular message that we're sharing. In your classroom, how can these activities be utilized to benefit your students? What adjustments will you need to make? How will students link identifying emotions to communication skills? Pause now, go to your learning and reflection guide, and complete this stop and do. Welcome back. Let's look now at relationship skills. As mentioned earlier, relationships are key in learning, and communication is central to relationships. Teaching communication to students will benefit them and benefit their relationships and benefit learning. Students should know about communication jammers and be able to identify these. Now, there are several listed here on the slide, including blaming, and judging, shaming and name-calling, ordering, ridiculing, threatening, warning and commanding. All of these communication, well, communication jammers uh, do just that. They stop communication. They block the message from coming in when we hear these. As previously discussed, you might identify these communication blockers in text. How did the person communicate and what communication blocker are we seeing and identifying there? Have the students discuss how those blockers relate to the text and what alternatives could have been utilized. How could the person have rephrased that? What might they have done differently or said differently? They can then link that to th this idea to their own lives and their own communication patterns. And we can look for when communication jammers might be present. Now, I would take some time to practice this in a more neutral way before directing it right at the students. You might reflect to yourself and say, I just realized that I may have sounded like I was ordering you here, and I may have said it a little bit more firmly than I needed to. Here's what we're going to do, or here's how I'd like to rephrase. The, the most, the safest way, I should say, is through literature, of course, or through reading some piece of text where this comes up. That way, it's completely separate from you and the students and their classmates, and that way they can build awareness around what communication jammers are so that they can identify them later within themselves or when they're hearing them and try and look past the communication jammer to what the actual message is, or rephrase for themselves so that others can hear their message. Students can also learn to use I statements. Here, they utilize this formula to express their emotions related to a particular action. For example, they start off with I feel, then the action or word choice, and add because. I feel happy when I can see your faces in our virtual classroom because I miss being with you in person. Now I chose this example in specific because often people think of these I statements and I feel statements as utilized when there's something a little bit more negative happening. I feel frustrated when, 
I feel upset when. But it doesn't have to only be for those uncomfortable emotions. It can also be for happiness, for joy, uh, excitement, uh, whatever it happens to be. So consider how you would utilize these and teach this formula to students and have them practice it. This, again, is a sample sentence starter, sentence frame that students might use and practice with each other. Again, have them start off with the positive so they get used to using this kind of statement, and then they can build in other more uncomfortable feelings along the way when they're used to using the, the I statement. Now, it's important that you start off with the I feel words rather than the action. If you start with the action, it goes back to our communication jammers and makes it feel like you're blaming or judging. So st always teach students to start with the I feel and then add the word or the action or word choice. You can also build in appreciations and shout outs. This is a time for students to acknowledge, thank, and celebrate each other. You might use Thankful Thursday, for example, but really it can be any time of the week. You might do it in a morning meeting or an advisory period. It may be one of those five-minute wrap-ups when you have reached the end of the lesson, but you've got a couple of minutes before the tra next transition. Students can also add gestures here, like a virtual thumbs up or put their thumb up to the, to the, to the camera. They can put their hands in the air and wave them because they care. They can do a fireworks clap where they clap their hands together and then raise their hands up and pretend like there's fireworks in the air. Any of these can be utilized to help celebrate each other, to thank each other, to acknowledge each other. You can also build in gratitude journals. Now, generally, journals are written, and this provides a writing opportunity for students. You can also mix it, though, with having students share orally. So, for example, you might have students share great news or guess what? In this strategy, they share something that's happening in their lives. Great news! My mom's going to have a baby. I'm going to have a baby brother or sister. Or, guess what? I got an A on my test and I am so excited because I worked really hard. Or it might be, guess what? I made great gains in my reading fluency. Any number of things can be shared, and it might be something relatively small, or it might be something very large. Perhaps it's, um, great news, my mom is coming home from being deployed. They can also write about three good things, things that went well or are going well and why. And similarly, these can be small things, medium things, or large things. Or they might write a letter of thanks. They might write it to someone they know, parent or caregiver, a sibling, a friend, a teacher, an administrator. Or they might write a letter of thanks to or from a character in a book or story, or to or from a person in history, to or from a mathematician, to or from a scientist who's made a great discovery. Any content area can be utilized here. The idea is that they write a letter, and you can teach them letter writing skills and letter writing format, showing gratitude. Now, we know that expressing gratitude leads to higher levels of happiness, and research has indicated that. So just providing students the opportunity to think about, reflect upon, and express what they're grateful for leads to more life satisfaction and general happiness. And these are a few activities to help them do that. Consider your classroom. In what ways will you build in relationship skill strategies, such as identifying and avoiding communication blockers, utilizing I statements, appreciations and shout outs, or perhaps a gratitude journal in your classroom? Pause now and complete this stop and do in your learning reflection guide. Welcome back. Today, we looked at communication as it relates to social emotional learning and defined communication. We looked at ways and promoted positive interactions between the teacher and the student and among students. 
and we built effective communication in the virtual classroom. At Teacher Creative Materials, we have other workshops and keynote presentations and an array of free professional learning options designed with you in mind. We have on-demand webinars, coffee chats on trending subjects, and presentations by authors and experts. Check back regularly at go.tcmpub.com pd-info for an updated list of topics and formats that support your professional learning journey. We're working hard to support you whether, wherever you're teaching today and in the future. Please visit us at tcmpub.com. Thanks so much for your time today. If you have any questions, please contact us by email, and you can see the email there on your screen, or contact us by telephone. It's been a pleasure to work with you, and as a company founded and run by teachers, we know your time is valuable. Thanks for everything you do. Keep up the great work. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to your students. Be kind to everyone you encounter. Thanks, everyone.